Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. It's Wednesday night, and it's time for Friends in Fiction. It's, it's our favorite night of the week, and we hope it is for you, too. This is our last show of the season, y'all. Fastest season ever. I can't believe that. Um, and we will let you know at the end of tonight's show um, who is going to be on our schedule next season. So you will be the very first to know. So hang around for that. The new season begins April 19th. And it's hard to say it's our best one yet because they've all been so good, but guys, it might just be our best one yet. So for now, <laughs> let's get rolling because we have two amazing guests to get to tonight. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. And I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And this is Friends in Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support independent bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we'll be welcoming two huge names who have big releases this week. Best-selling authors Lisa Scottellini and Robert Dugoni. Of course, we're really looking forward to diving in with both of them. We are here, as we are every week, to bring you incredible authors, hot reads, and fascinating interviews, all while supporting independent booksellers. One way you can help us support indies is to buy from them when and where you can, or you can visit our own friendsandfictionbookshop.org page, where you can find Lisa's and Robert's books, and books by the four of us and all of our past guests at a discount. Now you hear us talking about our amazing Friends and Fiction official book club with Brenda and Lisa every week, but be sure you join their Facebook page so that you can be there next month on April 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern when they will be joined by one of last week's guests and one of our favorites, our friend Colleen Oakley, or as we now call her, Co-Oak or Coakley. I can't decide yet. <laughs> Coakley, <laughs> join, join them with Coakley to discuss her new novel, The Mostly True Story of Tanner and Louise. <laughs> and of course, we have our Writer's Block podcast that drops every single Friday. And it's on our Facebook page where we will always post a link to the newest episode. Or you can find it on all major podcasting platforms. On our most recent episode, which is out right now, Ron and I talked to Elizabeth Berg about her newest, Earth's the Right Place for Love, a really profound novel. And coming this Friday, Ron and Kristen are talking to Amita Parikh about the circus train. So listen, review, subscribe, share, listen, review, subscribe, <laughs> share, repeat, wash, rinse, do again. And share with a friend if you like what you hear. All right, ladies, it is time to welcome our first guest of the evening, author Robert Dugoni. Robert is the critically acclaimed New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and number one Amazon bestselling author of the Tracy Crosswhite Police series. He is also the author of the Charles Jenkins Espionage series, the David Sloan Legal Thriller series, and several standalone novels, including The Seventh Canon, Damage Control, and the literary novels. If, if you have been on Friends and Fiction, there's no way to avoid this book. Sorry. The Extraordinary Life of Sam Hell, a Suspense Magazine's 2018 Book of the Year, and it feels like a Friends and Fiction Book of the Year, for which yeah. Dugoni's narration won an audiophile earphones award and the critically acclaimed The World Played Chess, as well as the nonfiction expose, The Cyanide Canary, a Washington Post Best Book of the Year. Robert's books are sold in more than 25 countries and have been translated into more than 30 languages. Several of his novels have been optioned for movies and television series. 
Robert's the recipient of the Nancy Pearl Award for Fiction and a three-time winner of the Friends of Mystery Spotted Owl Award for Best Novel set in the Pacific Northwest. He's also been a finalist for many other awards, including the International Thriller Award, the Harper Lee Prize for Legal Fiction, the Silver Falcon Award for Mystery, and the Mystery Writers of America Edgar Award. His newest, Her Deadly Game, was just released yesterday. Juan, can you bring Robert on, please? Hi, Robert. Hey, Robert. Hi. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, sorry. I think you're muted. I, I, I think you're on mute, Robert. Oh, sorry. Okay, now you're off. There you, there you are. are. There you are. Hi, Robert. I was saying that was such a beautiful introduction. I don't know if I can do any better than that. I should just. <laughs> I know. Well, you can just sit here and we'll talk a little bit about all the amazing things that everyone says about you on the page. And then you can just go because it really is. I remember last year we were like, this, this is like his page now. Like, we're not really yeah. sure what we're doing. <laughs> that is true. Um, but we're so happy to have you here. We really, um, Ron and I really enjoyed having you on the podcast a couple of years ago to discuss the world played chess and of course the extraordinary life of Sam Hell, which is an undeniable friends of fiction favorite as we've said. Thank you. Um, but we are so excited to have you here tonight to talk about your new book and Robert, your protagonist Kira is um, just incredible, but she's really making a name for herself in Seattle as a prosecutor until a relationship with her senior colleague goes South, forcing her to go back home to her family's criminal defense firm their failing criminal defense firm. When she lands a high profile client, it seems like Kira's career might be saved. But what she uncovers as she begins to follow the evidence is a complicated and deadly game that Kira never saw coming. So it's just a little bit about what this book is about for readers who maybe haven't heard of it, which we can't imagine, but just in case. <laughs> but can you tell us what this novel is really about? Yeah, I, you know, I, really, I really wanted to write a book that was fun. Um, you know, fun to write. Um, it's got, it's a puzzle book. Um, you know, how did this, uh, Kira's, the case that Kira gets is a wealthy investment um, man. His wife is murdered. And the question is, you know, how did she die? He was supposedly at a uh, social function, charitable function in the community. And he calls in and, and his wife has been shot. Um, so there's an element of puzzle there. Uh, how did she die? And, um, you know, what really transpired? And then I really wanted to sort of do the things that I, I've been doing in all my other books, which is I take legal, uh, legal aspects, I take police procedural aspects, and I take family dynamics. And I sort of blend the three together and, um, and created this character and her family, the world that she lives in. And, um, you know, she takes on this case. She's not doesn't have a great deal of experience, but she has a lot. What she's really good at is she's very innovative, like her father. Uh, she's very smart and she's uh, perceptive. So um, she takes on this case. And, you know, the question is, did this guy kill his wife? Didn't he kill his wife? Can she get him off? If she does, what transpires? Ooh. Well, Bob, you said in an interview, one of the things you learned watching some British television is that if you have a good antagonist, don't kill him off. <laughs> Let him come back because one of the things that draws readers to stories is tension. And it's those antagonists that create that tension for the protagonist. I think that's really good advice. And the prosecutor in this case, Miller Ambrose, is the textbook definition of a good antagonist. And just to complicate matters a little worse, make them worse, is Kira's former, he is for, Kira's former lover. Uh, what was the inspiration for Miller? You know, I, I have, um, I have four sisters. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm fairly aware of the difficulties that they've encountered in their professional lives um, and some of the things that have gone on. And then working in the legal field with a lot of, you know, very skilled uh, female lawyers, you know, you, you, you see things. Um, so, you know, we, we all are guilty of making mistakes in our lives, you know, the wrong relationships, uh, the wrong place to have a relationship. And um, this is one of those instances, um, you know, Kira comes from a, a, a difficult family background. Um, her father is an alcoholic, so her family is very dysfunctional. And, um, you know, she's been impacted by that. And uh, so she enters into this relationship and, 
you know, she begins to realize right away, this is a mistake. Um, he drinks too much. Uh, he's opinionated. And when she goes to him and very professionally and diplomatically says, I don't think this is working, he makes her life miserable. Um, and she has to leave. So, you know, it's a, it's a situation that male or female, I think we've, we've all been probably guilty of it to one extent or another. Um, but it's, it's what, what transpires is what makes him so bad. He's, um, you know, he's a predator. He's a, he's a bad guy. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I can see Miller Ambrose coming back in future books. How, um, how important was your own litigation experience when you were creating this novel? Did you, did you experience, uh, or work in an office where you could see that kind of, um, sexual harassment of a colleague? Well, I no, not 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 so explicit like that. But I worked as a lawyer in the 1980s, and um, you know that's that's no excuse for what transpired. But it was a different time period then. Definitely. And um, you know there was you know the Christmas parties were were <laughs> legendary uh, for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know there were part married partners going home with secretaries, and you know a, a lot of those things transpired. Um, uh, I entered into a relationship uh, with someone that worked at the firm. You know, that was a mistake. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was single at the time. Um, but you Glad know, so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Clarification. Clarification. Okay. Um, you see all those things and they, and they, you know, as you all know, all those things that, that we live through become a part of us and, and they mm -hmm. become a part of the characters that we create. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Which is exactly where I was going, because I'm always so fascinated by the way that our personal lives, sometimes unconsciously and sometimes on purpose, find their way into our novels. And sometimes other people can see it more than we can. My family has said, oh, you used, and I'm like, oh, yeah, on purpose. <laughs> you know, so sometimes it ekes its way in on purpose and sometimes subconsciously. But in your book, Kira Duggan, Duggan, Duggan. Dugan. But Dugan. Okay. And her family really come to life on the page. And you've casually mentioned it, but you have a huge family. I believe you come from a family with 10 children. Yes. yes. So how much did the experience growing up with that many siblings? And also, I believe you had a binge drinking grandfather. How much did all of that kind of work its way into this novel? Well, again, I think, uh, you know, every character is of us, right? Every character yeah. is of the, of the author. And, and so, yes, I, I do have a large family and they're all wonderful human beings, but they're, we're all different. You know, some yeah. of us are type A, some of us are type B. Um, we're, we all have our own, our own little bugaboos, if you will. Um, and my mother did come from an alcoholic household. My, my grandfather was a very successful dentist, but he was a binge drinker. And I do remember occasions where he would come for a for a holiday event and he would be drunk. And I can remember my dad driving him home. Um, I can remember my mother putting her head down and when you know she'd see him as we're heading to a wedding and he stumbles off the curb and my mother putting her head down and saying, oh, daddy, oh, daddy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was very anxiety provoking for my mom. It was it was difficult. I think anybody that's ever been in an alcoholic household can understand you know, that you don't walk out of that unscathed. And, and my mother didn't walk out unscathed. Um, she's a wonderful lady, but, um, you know, it, it, was, it was something that, that defined her. She was, she was old enough that she was the one that used to have to, her mother would say to her, go down and get your father. And uh -huh. she and her sister would have to go down the street to get her dad who was at work and he was drunk and bring him home. And um, she told stories of being in the waiting room and having to tell all the patients waiting, Dr. Brannick is ill and is not available. And remarkably, they would all come back. Huh. Um, so, you know, she, those experiences, she didn't talk about them a lot, but um, but when she talked about them, they, they hit home. And then as I got older, uh, she would say to my brother, my older brother and I, she'd say, drive over to Marin County and and go check on your grandfather. I can't get him on the phone. Um, and my dad would tell us to pull all the spark plugs out of the car so he so that my grandfather couldn't drive, you know. And and so there were those instances as well. Um, 
you know, I had no real relationship with my grandfather because of that. Um, you know, he, he wasn't a grandfather that was always around and it, it wasn't, it just, it never really, never really transpired. So, um, you know, it's a different, it's a difficult family dynamic and, um, the family members are all impacted by it. Her two brothers, uh, one is a recovering alcoholic. The other one is still a drinker. Um, her two sisters are insecure, uh, and have, you know, have difficulty in their personal relationships. So it's all those things. And, and Kira begins to self-evaluate some of her own life and some of the things that, that uh, she does in her life, uh, one of which is having a drink when she gets home at night. And she begins to wonder, you know, do I need this drink or do I want this drink? And the two are not the same. Yeah. Well, was a lot of it on purpose or did you see yourself doing it when you were doing it, you know, weaving some of these things you knew about yourself and your life? Um, I, I, I knew about it. I mean, I, I was, yeah, okay. I was weaving these things in, um, on purpose. Okay. Yeah. And you know, the, the dinner at the, at the dinner table is not unlike the dinner I used to experience with my nine siblings, you know, there was okay. always a yeah. quip and a, and a, something would happen and might have, you know, some really intelligent, quick witted brothers and, you know, so a lot of that would, would play into it. Um, dinners were entertainment for us, you know, <laughs> they were, they were fun. Uh, I can remember the first time my brother brought his now wife home for dinner and she asked for a bread roll. So uh, rather than pass the bread rolls to her, I picked one up and threw it down the table to her. <laughs> I didn't think anything of it. I just tossed it to her. And she remembers that to this day. You <laughs> That's know? amazing. I, I Oh, that's awesome. Well, Robert, in addition to being a novelist and also a, a champion bread thrower, you are also a teacher. So um, I think I speak for all of us when I say I wish we could take your class um, and also receive a role. I'm here ready to catch. But I've read that you tell your students, Michelangelo didn't just start chipping away at a piece of granite and come up with David. He studied for years. He studied anatomy and biology to create all of his masterpieces, which I, I love that analogy. I think we can all relate to that. And, and we really like it. We have a lot of writers out there listening, including, of course, the four of us. Is there a writing tip you could share with us that has maybe um, been helpful to your students that you think might be helpful to our broader community of writers, too? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Don't do what I did, which is um, <laughs> don't think you know how to write a novel. Just even if you're a writer, if you're a reporter, which I was or whatever it is, don't don't think, oh, I, I then I know how to write a novel. Um, study the craft, which is which is really what I had to do. I had to yeah. put the brakes on. I had to step back, and I really took about three years uh, to to go and to study the craft of writing a novel. And there's so many great books out there that that um, you know your listeners can can uh, can grab. Christopher Vogler's book, The Writer's Journey, Save the yeah. Cat, um, On Writing by Saul Stein. Um, Writing the Breakout Novel by Donald Moss, um, Story Trump Structure by Stephen James. I mean, stories that are really about, you know, do this and don't do that. Um, and once I started to learn the craft, um, then I started to have some success. And I think the thing I learned and that I try to tell my new students is it's not really the plot that is going to capture your reader's attention. It's the characters. So the artistry right? The artistry still exists, even though you're in a structured environment. I could study uh, um, anatomy and biology, but I sure couldn't, you know, create the David. You know, that's, that's, a, that's the beauty of the art that Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and all those great artists had, but they did it within a structured environment and one that came from, from knowing what they were doing. Yeah, very good points. Yeah, I love that. So, Robert, I loved this. Um, this was something that I was particularly interested in after talking to you about some of your other books in the past. So Publishers Weekly wrote, Kira, a well-developed and nuanced lead, has an additional complication to deal with. A stranger who knows she's an accomplice chess player emails her, you're in the game of your life, so play like your life depends on it because it very well might. So this is obviously not the first time that chess has shown up in your novels, um, probably most notably in and the world played chess. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, do you play chess? And if so, you know, what is it for you that that makes this something that keeps showing up in your novels? And and this book in particular, is it a metaphor for some of the struggles that Kira is facing? 
So no, I do not play chess. Uh, you I, don't. Oh I do my not, gosh. I do not play chess. Uh, okay. But when I was practicing law, some of the best trial attorneys that I met and knew were chess players. And one of those trial attorneys explained to me one time that the two were really very similar because when you are a chess player, you can anticipate what your opponent is going to do. But in that anticipation, you have to leave open the possibility that they will do something else, mm -hmm. usually potentially three or four other things. So um, in trial, you can't go in saying, I know what this person is going to say on the witness stand, be even if you've taken their deposition, because they might say something different. And so you need to be prepared to counter whatever it is they say. Um, so when I was putting this together, I wanted the reader to know that Kara is incredibly intuitive. She's incredibly perceptive. And she's also um, very adept at, at shifting, uh, depending on, on what comes her way. And she is this way in part because she is such an accomplished chess player. Um, and uh, she stopped playing chess publicly. She was in tournaments because her, her father showed up at one of her tournaments drunk. And she did not want to be embarrassed again. So now she plays online. Um, I went to a grandmaster who was referred to me by a friend. His name is Elliot Neff. He runs a foundation called Chess for Life, which does really marvelous things for young people. Um, he teaches them in chess, you can either win, draw, or learn, right? You never lose Ooh. as long as you're learning. And, you know, in trial for a trial attorney, that's also something that I think was very perceptive. So I used Elliot and I said to Elliot, this is what I want to do. I want to create a chess game that mimics what's happening in the investigation and in the trial. Um, Kira makes a move, the opponent makes a move. Kira makes a counter move, the opponent makes a counter move. The queen's in danger in one part. You know, what, what does she do to, she moves the knight. So there's a lot of metaphors in there. And what Elliot did is Elliot went back through his files. He has records of every game he's ever played. He's a grandmaster <laughs> and he has a record of every game he's ever played. And he found one that he thought mimicked the investigation and the trial. So the chess game within the book is a real chess game. Wow. And I had oh to be my very goodness. You know, I had to get it right because as you all know, being writers, if you make a mistake, Yep. Yeah. You're going to get caught on it. And I had a really perceptive uh, copy editor who said to me something to the effect of, you have pawn to, to pawn to, to P P3. And he said, that's not the move. The move is pawn to. And I said, no, this is a grandmaster. He said, I'm telling you, it's the wrong move. So I called up Elliot and Elliot said, looked at his notes and Elliot said, he's right. It's P5. It's not P3. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. People are going to play the game. And so yeah. I needed to make it right. It's kind of like you don't make a mistake with guns, right? You don't get a gun wrong. Because if you get a gun wrong, every gun person out there will call you on it. Yeah. That yeah. Anything. Sense. I mean, oh my goodness. Yeah. The, the emails, you just better make, you better make sure that you got all your facts straight because <laughs> someone out there will know. Get a note. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, Robert, you have been such an incredible guest and we are um, so grateful that you came on today to share your time with us and um, just absolutely cannot wait for all of our readers out there to read her deadly game. So before we let you go, can you tell us where our readers can find you online? And then also um, if you have any upcoming tour dates that you could share. Yeah. Um, so on online uh, it's just go to Robert Dagoni books. Uh, dot com and you'll get my website. I'm also on uh, Amazon, you know, um, Rob, it's, I think it's uh, Robert, Robert Tagoni slash books. Uh, I'm on all the social handles, the, the fiction, the, the uh, Facebook and Twitter, you know, at Robert Tagoni. Um, I'm pretty easily uh, found. I, I now have a, uh, a, my daughter who's really good with TikTok and all that stuff. And so she's came to me and said, dad, you really need to get, and I said, do it. So she's, uh, she's in, in will she do it for us too? I know. <laughs> what, what's your daughter's rate? <laughs> I'm sure she, I'm sure she would. Uh, she's, she's really very talented. So she's helping me with that. Um, 
And as far as tour tour dates go, I'm going to be um, this next starting tomorrow and for the weekend. I'm going to be in uh, Denver for Readers Take Denver. Uh, I'm going to be um, in um, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, to do a library event there. And then in uh, May, I have some other uh, dates coming up. So um, yeah, I have I have quite a bit on on my plate. Time. Awesome. Well, thank you for fitting us in. We are so happy to see you and um, hopefully we'll we'll see you again, maybe in real life. Maybe we'll see you on tour. Yeah, that, that would be great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all for having me and, and for having me again. I, I really appreciate it. And you guys run a really a, a wonderful, wonderful site um, that they, they, they have, as you said, talked a lot about the extraordinary life of Sam Hell and you sounds to me like you have a lot of really educated readers on your site. So thank you for having me. I'm very grateful. It's our oh, pleasure. Oh, we love thank having you, so you Bob. Yeah. Take have care. Safe travels. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, we are excited to get to Lisa Scottolini, but first a few quick messages from us. We're thrilled about so many things coming up from the new schedule to the past schedule to the podcast, but we are also so thrilled because we get to celebrate four new novels this year, one from each of us. To make sure you don't miss a single one, I want you to check out our Friends and Fiction first edition subscription box, which is an entire mouthful, so I'm going to say it again. Friends and Fiction First Edition subscription box with our friends at Booktown. You'll get signed first editions of my book, The Secret Book of Flora Lee, in May, Kristen's book, The Paris Daughter, in June, Christie's The Summer of Songbirds in July, and Mary Kay's Bright Lights Big Christmas in September. Plus, you get this adorable limited edition kitchen towel that says, Dinner Can Wait, It's Time for Friends and Fiction. You can order from them right now at booktown.com and the booktown has an E at the end. And we appreciate your support so much. We do. We do. So we um, hope that you guys have those signed books in your hands soon. And so speaking of those signed books, we wanted you to know about our in-person events coming up. You can always read about them in our newsletters and on our individual websites. But for a quick recap, we will be in Columbus, Ohio on April 26th, Charleston, South Carolina with Buxton Books on May 1st to celebrate the launch of Patty's brand new The Secret Book of Flora Lee, Huntsville, Alabama on June 6th um, for Kristen's The Paris Daughter, and Tampa, Florida, July 20th at Oxford Exchange for my launch of The Summer of Songbirds. Tickets for all of those events are on sale now. And, oh, yep, MKA. <laughs> Right. Now we're going to be in Christie's hometown of Beaufort, North Carolina on August 1st for a breast cancer fundraising event with earlier.org. And we just finally locked in the date for my Bright Lights Big Christmas Launch Friends and Fiction Live launch event. And that one will be Wednesday, October 4th in Darien, Connecticut. <laughs> So mark your calendars. That's six chances to see all of us together live between April and October. I think we need to have like a, a prize for the person who goes to makes it to all. Oh my gosh, all, makes it to yeah. all. Oh, yeah. we should. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. We'll come up with, we got to come up with something good. Yeah. For yeah. yeah. Anyway, make sure you're signed up for Do our Do we friends. count? <laughs> yeah, we are the prize. Do we get, Do we get like, a prize? Uh, for it's going to be like, where's no. my prize? <laughs> no, you don't get to win. That's not how it works. <laughs> okay. okay. Make sure that you are signed up for our Friends in Fiction newsletter and for our individual newsletters that, so that you're always the first one to know. And coming up at the close of the show tonight, we'll tell you how you can find out what our spring summer season of Friends in Fiction has in store. And of course, among all the great guests we have booked for you this upcoming season, we also have brand new releases from three of the four of us. So it's going to be tons of fun. You know what else is going to be tons of fun? That is right. It is our next guest, guest the warm, witty, and hilarious Lisa Scottolini. Fasten your seatbelts, guys. It's going to be a bumpy <laughs> ride, or a, but a fun one. Lisa Scottolini, a longtime dear friend of mine, is a number one best-selling author, the New York Times best-selling author, and Edgar Award-winning author of 35 novels, including her latest work, Loyalty. 
which was just released yesterday. She also writes a weekly column with her daughter, Francesca Saratella, titled Chick Wit, which is a witty and fun take on life from a woman's perspective. After running in the Philadelphia Inquirer for 15 years, Chick Wit is now available online. These stories, along with many other never before published stories, have been collected in the New York Times bestselling series of humorous memoirs, including their most recent, I love this title, I See Life Through Rosé-Colored Glasses. <laughs> and earlier books, I Need a Lifeguard Everywhere But the Pool. They're so funny. I've got sand in all the wrong places. <laughs> Does this beach make me look fat? My nest isn't empty. It just has more closet space. And the best one of all, Why My Third Husband Will Be a Dog, which has been optioned <laughs> for TV. Love it. Lisa reviews popular fiction and nonfiction, and her reviews have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Philadelphia Inquirer. She's also served as president of Mystery Writers of America and has taught a course she developed, Justice and Fiction, at the University of Pencil Pennsylvania Law School, her alma mater. Perhaps most importantly of all, she's the owner of a football jersey wearing cutout of actor Bradley Cooper, also known as Flat Bradley, which we all know as a good luck charm that helped the Eagles get to the Super Bowl this year. So Lisa lives in the Philadelphia area with Flat Bradley and an array of disobedient pets, and she would not have it any other way. Juan, can you bring Lisa on, please? Hi, the Hi best Lisa. Intro ever. <laughs> I love it. Yes, I'm Lisa Scatellini, and I live with a cardboard cutout of a man. <laughs> You know what? It's not a working for me. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so, so great. It's we, so we're great. Only, we're only disappointed you didn't bring him along to the interview. I mean, we're kind of no, hurt. Are really we not sad. good enough for Flap Bradley? No, no, the problem is that I broke him. So the top, there's a top half left and a bottom half. Guess which one mommy prefers? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I couldn't, you, you, you got me started. It's your fault. We opened the door. It's really our fault. We, have, we bring out the best in you. We bring out the best. <laughs> That's right. I love so, it. I love you guys. Thank you so oh, much for having me. Oh, we're <laughs> thrilled that you're here. So Lisa, you know, one of the things we love doing on the show is having a little warm up chat. And when I was thinking about what to chat about tonight, I thought of how immediate and generous your response was when I asked you uh, whether you might participate in that March 7th Adventures by the Book event that we did to bring awareness uh, for the importance of mammograms. Not only did you immediately say yes, but you sent me a fabulous video and you were just the loveliest guest that evening. So it got me thinking about the acts of kindness we do for one another. Aww. And so tonight I would love to ask all of you this question. Can you share a story of a time that someone went out of his or her way to help you in a way that really made an impact in your life? So Lisa, I'll give you a minute to think of your answer. And I will start with your longtime friend, Mary Kay. Yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> last year when we lost our daughter, Katie, to COVID, our circle of friends mobilized and surrounded us with love. When we arrived home from the hospital that night, our dearest neighbors were waiting for us. One sister friend had already flown into town and another one was on the way. My crazy designer friend Clay took charge of catering and hosting out of town guests. And of course, all of you all, all my friends and sisters, sisters, friends and fiction sisters, <laughs> put their own lives on hold, magically materialized, locked and loaded and dressed in coordinating <laughs> black ensembles. <laughs> to tote and lift and arrange and rearrange charcuterie trays. And I will <laughs> never, ever forget that kindness. We love you, Mary. Well, love you, Kathy. we do. And I think all of that is great, but it is such a testament to all of the things that you do totally willingly without anyone asking yes, for all yes. the people in your life. And I think that was something really, really special for all of us to get to see is we know how much we love you, but to get to see all of the people who um, were just there for you guys in such a big way, because you have been there for them. And I think that's really, really yeah. special. Yeah, that's so true. Um, yeah. I don't know. This wasn't what I was going to say, but this just popped into my head <laughs> when you were talking. Um, 
And I just, I don't know, this just, it's just something that I remember and I just thought it was so fun. So um, when my first book came out, um, all of my teachers from high school, um, they were all different places, you know, because it was, I guess, you know, like a while after I'd graduated high school, obviously, but they all came back from, you know, their respective schools, wherever they were at that point. Um, and they came, they showed up like early at my very first book event. Um, oh, and I just thought it was so nice. I just remember like walking in the store and seeing all of them there and just being Aww. so excited because, um, you know, they were all such a big part of like my life and my story and, and my journey to becoming a writer. So I thought that was really cool. That's awesome. How, yeah. how about that you, Patty? Is- so sweet. And it it feeds right into what I was going to say, because for me, it's often like sometimes the big grand gestures are are great, but other times it's just about showing up. And that's what you're saying, Christy, like just showing up. And there are the big things like when my friends and family showed up during my cancer treatment, but it's often the small and unheralded, unheralded, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> things that are not wrong about that touch me so much. My birthday was last week and someone left flowers on my front porch in a bunny vase or a card that shows up for no reason. And all of you out there who show up to hear us talk about a book that you've already heard us talk about, but you show up anyway, you just show up. So you do the thing and it's that thing that matters and it's showing up. So small or large, Kindnesses are just not forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, Lisa? You know, I will tell you the God's honest truth, which is when I think about it, I think about you guys. I oh, mean, and I kind of want to say that to this group. Well, it's true because you started, you know, I just want to start people to understand that I, I write and we all write. And I have the great luxury of writing. The thing I do all day is write. Um, You guys do that. And so I want to sort of say to your audience how much time that takes. And by the way, I don't even have a family to take care of. I live alone. I have a dog and a cat that pretends she doesn't know me. Like my cat is turning 16 next week. And that's like she never saw me before every day of her life. (laughs) What what I really want to say to your audience is that these ladies do in the time that I just spend writing, they just write and they do this and they read these books and they come on and they, you want to talk about a group of authors, by the way, dear to my heart, a group of women who help other women and put themselves out with such regularity. It's one thing to do it once in a while. You guys have a schedule. You guys have a subscription. You have a subscription you can barely pronounce altogether. I mean, that <laughs> I know, organization, right? or at least I can. And really, yeah. And truly what it really, what it really speaks to is dedication. It's not just the one of, you know, you talk about the person who shows up, it's reliability. It's, it's yeah. rock steady and it's so reliable that it's a constant. So I just, I know your audience knows this, but as a person who comes in, I kind of would just remind them that these women that you're looking at week after week would bust their butts. And they write also. And you see the books and they're all nice and they're all gorgeous, beautiful covers. And the women are beautiful too. But so much goes into this. You guys do good for all of us every single week. And and it's just remarkable to me. So that, honestly, you're the first thing that came to the mind and the last. So that's really what I'm going to say. I believe it. Lisa, what a kind thing to say. Thank you so much. It's so weird how we keep asking her back. I know. I don't know why. I don't know why. (laughs) You're my girlfriend. Well, you know, I really, look, I believe in love. And you guys put love into the universe. And so, Kristen, you can't be surprised when you, if you ask anybody, we will say, how high do you want us to jump? Because anyone who's going to put that kind of love into the universe you should be showered back with the love. And that's what I'm that. I'm happy to do it. I'm just happy well, to do it. I love that. Lisa, uh, I think I speak yeah. for all of us when we say we all love you. So thank you. Thank you for those kind words. And, and thanks. Thanks thank for you. just being you. We, we appreciate it. Um, all right. Yes. We, we have to get to your book, though. We really want to talk about loyalty, which, I mean, you know how much I loved it. You and I have had a conversation, many conversations about how much I have loved this book. But can you begin by giving us the elevator pitch for loyalty. You know, I sat down to write this script and I thought, 
I'm, I'm going to describe this in a few sentences. And then I was like, nope, I'm going to oh. leave this to Lisa because it is such a big sweeping book. I would love for you to give us the elevator pitch for loyalty. And then can you tell us what the book is really about at its heart? Well, you know what? Maybe I'll flip that because I think what's really about at its heart really is a nice segue because I think loyalty is a wonderful thing. You guys are loyal to each other. You're loyal to all the, the authors that come on. By the way, you had my daughter on with her debut novel, Francesca, which I, I love you forever for that, you know? I mean, I lactate even thinking about how wonderful that thing is going to do. Sorry. I'll go love. I'm in this weird hotel room. I'll go like this. Um, I, I, love, I love loyalty. I regard myself as loyal. I, it really matters to me. But I wanted to write a book that explored not only the good stuff of loyalty, yeah. like the goodwill that you guys do, but also that sometimes what are its contours? Yeah. Where does it end? When does it turn bad? You know, you're going to be yeah. loyal no matter what. Where does it interfere with your own moral compass? And how does that at play your life? So that's the big themes that are kind of involved in loyalty. And the headline, what it's about. It's about four lives of four people who collide in a really surprising way against the rise of the mafia in Sicily in the 1800s. I love it. That's it. It was a much better elevator pitch than I could have done. That was fantastic. <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you. That was perfect. And I always, I always love hearing about what it's really about, but yours yeah. is just sitting right there in the title. Like, this is what it's yeah. about. Loyalty. <laughs> so... Those of us who have had the total pleasure of following you on social media, which everyone out there should do, we know how important your Italian heritage is to you. We also know how important Bradley is. But can you talk to us about why it has become so important to you in recent years to tap into that piece of your own history and to share these historical stories of Italy with your readers well, that's really kind of you to say, because I think I'm not different from anybody else as they enter their dotage, as they watch your estrogen levels wane and wane and wane. <laughs> it's like a gas tank. Oh, you're on empty. But in any event, when you get your people start at some point to turn to Ancestry.com and all that stuff, which I think is so yeah. fascinating. And part of me started to think with Eternal, which was my first historical fiction novel, even though you ladies are experts, but that was my first time. And I was like, well, maybe you're not too old to try it. And partly I wanted to answer the question of why did Italy, since I am Italian American, why did Italy go so wrong during fascism? And so for loyalty, I started to want to ask the question, why did Sicily go so wrong for the mafia? Like what is mm. happening with regard to that? Because I'm super proud of my American ancestry. I always think like my family, you heard, you know, Robert had so many kids in his family. I, my mother was the youngest of 19. <gasps> I know, right? I know. Oh, oh wow. That's born Catholics. I'm really a lot better Catholic than I could ever dream of being. Oh, oh wow. Like, the, um, my mother's, my mother, her mother had two husbands and the first one died. And, you know, you could guess how. I was like, dude, <laughs> you need yeah. to just oh. read it like everybody else. And in oh. any event, <laughs> my point is, it was, it was a family that had very humble origins. Nobody went to college. Nobody had money for that. So my mother went to high school. My father went to college in GI Bill. Being proud of Amer being American is so part and parcel of who I am because if not for public education and public libraries, I don't get to be an author. I mean, I'm, I'm among the first in my family to go to college, much less law school. So as proud as I am about America, I'm also proud about it being Italian. But I really wanted to not just go, yay, yay. You know, if, if, my, if Sicily gave rise to the mafia, why? It, I hope to God it's not something about being Italian or being Sicilian. The answer is, of course it isn't. And so when you look at Sicily and you do the research, and I as a lawyer and kind of former law professor wants to go, what are the conditions that gave rise to this? And you find out that basically inequality and oppression, you know, that there's a nobil noble class and you can't buy a house. You can never move up if you weren't born into nobility. And those people make all the laws for everybody else and they keep everybody else down. And you sort of learn that's the rough sketch from why if you keep people down, they're trying to get up. They just want equality of opportunity. They find oh, a way to wow. get. And that's what happened. Yeah. And that's why the mafia was born in Sicily. Absolutely. 
Oh, I just think some of the best stories come out of our heritage or our families. And you're right. The older we get, the more we dig into Ancestry.com. Yeah. It's so fascinating. There's something there. Well, I did it. It's fascinating. I did the 23 and Me. You know, it was like my daughter, my, yep. my Christmas present to my daughter. She's like, Mom, really? I'm going to spit in a cup for Christmas? I'm like, honey, it's cool. <laughs> and then we found out all this stuff and where we're from originally. Because I think it's, you know, it's interesting that when Bob was saying before, that people, I love books for characters. And so identity and how the character is outlined and who they are inside, like who we are inside, who we are inside is all anybody really cares about. And if you write something that a true character will really touch people. So I, it's not really surprising to me that people, when they have time to reflect, maybe they've retired or whatever, have a little more time, start to go, or maybe before they're going to leave the planet, start to go, well, who am I? Who is who living this life? Yeah. Right. I mean, what, ca- what, hey, I'm the main character of this life. Am I a hero? Am I a villain? Uh, where did I come from? What did I make of it? And, and the stuff of that. And to me also, I think it's a very American question because we believe in, and I believe in so much that we can have an American dream that we can change our status, not necessarily make more money, but be happier. You know, when you read yeah. the founding documents, they're all about the pursuit of happiness. The idea is that equality will make you be happier. That's yeah. really a great idea. That's true. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Look at our case. I love it. There was a time many years ago when there weren't as many women authors as they are now, and they certainly yeah. weren't on their own shows. I mean, one of the reasons I started out thanking you is because, frankly, I'm not sure that women get tons of press and review attention. So guess what you guys did? You made a workaround and you gave it to everyone you know, <laughs> even men. That's great. <laughs> Go <laughs> only, some, only some like Bob who are just like awesome and so nice. <laughs> no, Lisa, this book is um, just mind blowing, especially in just these incredible characters that you create ranging from a kidnapped boy raised in a madhouse to a reclusive cheesemaker with a secret to a lawyer with a divine calling to a girl so luminous she seems to embody light itself to two twin brothers whose winding road to power is soaked with the blood of innocent men. Drawing so many characters so vividly must have been an enormous challenge. Why did it feel right to you to craft this story with such a large and assorted cast? And how did you go about weaving all of these seemingly separate tales together? Well, thank you for saying that. I mean, the short story is, I thought I would just have, I never have an, I just have an idea. And it was like, let's figure out why the mafia rose in Sicily. And I actually went to Sicily. And then as soon as I got there, I saw, I found out about this incredible real life. I mean, this was true secret society that was called the Beati Pauli, the Blessed of St. Paul. And what they were was an aristocratic circle who got together to do good, kind of like you guys. You know, like, (laughs) we're just kind of, yeah, what, right? And and basically, I thought this is so interesting because that's happening at the same time as the mafia is rising, all these good guys. And then I thought, well, that'll be your book. And then what happened was I started to travel outside Palermo and see so much of the terrain and see how different it was. Yeah. And so you go, well, you got a fishing village, you know, I'll leave that out. And then, you know, it's like when you go, like you're in the food store and you go in for one thing and you end up with 45 things. <laughs> That's kind of what it was like. Um, it's just like going character shopping. I just thought of that, but it's kind of true. So that, then I go to a mountaintop village. I say, well, I'd love to have a character who lives in this. And how does the land form him? And then if you have right this kind of wide swath of characters, then in a way, you're not even writing a novel about Sicily at all. You're writing a novel. This is going to sound crazy, but it's about the world because yeah. Sicily is a little yeah. microcosm. It's been colonized so many times. And like I said, the law made by colonizers. And what do these people do? And what do these people do? And how do we all work? It isn't very much different from how we worked here, right? Yeah. We were colonizers and then we colonized. And so we got to figure all that stuff out. And it enabled me to sort of go, well, Lisa, you're not getting any younger. You should just try to go where this story is leading you. And I guess it's going to have one of these characters because you're kind of loving this whole broader canvas. And it's kind of nice because my thrillers tend to be a little more narrow. So it's fun to get Mm. bigger in something like royalty. It's a long answer when I promised a short answer. Welcome to me. 
<laughs> did it take longer to write? Answer. Did it take longer to write than your than your mysteries? Like because it's so uh, the you because you widen that that net. Did it take you longer than a mystery? That's a really good question, Patty. I, I you know what the truth is, it didn't because but yeah. it took me longer because I um it took me longer to edit because I hated to lose things and also because I still had that nervous anxiety. Like, can I do it? I always think I yeah. worry. Can I do this? And then when it gets bigger, you're going, Lisa, you just started writing historical fiction. Why don't you just slow your roll a little? You know, and the Eternal was three main characters. It was related. This is four characters, but because they're not, don't live physically proximate, it had to be separate stories that come together in some big twist. And I didn't know if I could do it until the end. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess that, I guess you did it. <laughs> That's not impressive, is it? That didn't sound good. I wanted to impress. No, them, that's exactly what I was curious <laughs> about. That's exactly what I was curious about. about. I was. I get an F in Friends and Fiction. <laughs> no, I'm just hilarious. I want to be in your head. Like I want to be inside that story for a little while. Amazing. <laughs> okay, so you let us, Lisa. You read, let us right into my question about. You know, you became known primarily for your mysteries. I mean, uh, there are a lot of us who still, you know, we're still waiting for Benny and Mary to come back. Um, and your mysteries and your thrillers have have sold tens of millions of copies worldwide. But now this is your second, Loyalty is your second sweeping historical novel. How different is it working on a novel like this and touring to talk about a novel like this? Is it, I mean, did you bring in any of your mystery writing tools or thriller tools when you set about writing? And this book is very different um, from last year's book. Well, um, I, I know because you you guys write. And I'm, I'm fans of all of your novels, and you know that, and your your audience must know that. And I think a little bit you learn on the job, which is kind of good and bad because yeah. we can all read our grades on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. Believe me, I do. I check them every day. Yeah. I check three, I check three. <laughs> so we're not crazy. Scale. Oh, please. And when they give me that five stars, I go, did you find this helpful? I go, you're darn cute. And I did. Boop, boop. I, I, bing. Yeah. Yes, bing. Not for four stars, only five. Um, <laughs> hey, you know, I can we be are, We are feeling stars. seen. <laughs> totally seen. <laughs> so bad. Yeah, so people who don't read the reviews, I can barely, I'm like, really? You're like a god. Because honestly, I memorize my reviews. Oh. But I, <laughs> but you know what the, the weird thing to seriously answer your question, my amazing pal, Mary Kay, is that now that I've done historical fiction and domestic thrillers and whatever I've done, I'm like you guys, you know, I feel like these differences are superficial. Place and setting is just a superficial difference to me. It's really the core is a family, whether it's a crime family or not. And I have some not so great members of my family. Uh, they're basically borderline <laughs> felonious. We can't even go there on this messy show. But, you know, you're always coming back to these themes and you always have to tell a really good story and it has to move fast. It, it, people, I like that. I get impatient. So yeah. um, in a way, what I've taught myself, it's almost be not afraid, you know, fear not, because I was afraid. I'm probably more, I, less so. It doesn't go away completely. But I was like, this isn't that different. This is the same thing. Yeah. You know, just because you're going to set it in Sicily 1800s, you know what the difference is? You get to go to Sicily and eat a lot of really great pasta. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, there you, you go. go. You go That's you such hard out. work. <laughs> pasta? When you were starting on starting with historic fiction, did you worry about because in mystery writing, mystery 101 is like, where's the body? How we got to get the body on the page now? Did you, so you don't have to. And when I first wrote a book that didn't have a body on a page, I didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> did you run into that? I don't do that. You know, I don't do that. I don't care about the 101. You know, the great thing about being a middle aged woman is if you follow rules your whole life, at some point you go, I'm not following the rules. Yeah, I'm making the rules now. I am making the damn rules. So I always just thought I'm telling a story about this person. And I never, and you know, I guess it, listen, no one knows better than you, Mary Kay, what it's like to have someone you love so deeply pass. Yeah. So I, I don't take it any differently in writing. We have all lost people. It's spring, my mother passed away in spring. 
I love and hate spring. I have to take me in that moment when I write a novel, it's no different. So I never did the drop the body thing that some people do and everyone can do it. I don't criticize it. It's just not for me. I'm too emotional. I can't take it. I just can't. And I, and the readers who come to me know that if somebody passes, we're going to go to the funeral. And also if you've done the research I've done with respect to, let's say violent crime, when someone passes from violent crime, a murder, that has implications forever. Right. And nobody needs to tell anybody that who watches the show and the news. So I think that writing about things like this has evolved and become more human. Mm. And it's also a person undergoing a thing. So it's specific to character. And I take it all the way too seriously. The 101 is out the window now, isn't it? We're the 101. Yeah. We make the rules. <laughs> We are the 101. I love how you count the two of us as middle age, considering uh, we both know that we're in our 60s. <laughs> and I'm even older That's than you. Middle age. That's middle age, girl. That's middle age. Okay, yeah, you middle age. Gonna be... <laughs> I, already had to one. I already had to replace <laughs> one. I can't go through another one. That's hilarious. This is, this is, I, have, I, have, I have bras older than most of you. So you <laughs> I'm just, I'm just telling you. Dear age God, dance. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> All right, Lisa, before we let you go, can you tell our viewers where they can find you on the road and also where they can find you online? Because, you know, I know Patty mentioned earlier how much fun we have following you um, with all your uh, antics and adventures. But if you could just tell us a little bit about how, how we could find you, we would love that. I am on, I'm on the road for the first time in four years. Like I haven't left the kitchen in four years. So this is so incredible. And uh, they can look on my website and they'll see where I'm going to be tonight. I'm at RJ Julia. Uh, we're all over the place. And, awesome. uh, and you can find me on social. I really believe in communicating. It's me online, you know, cause we all tweeted each other and email each other, <laughs> yeah. but I just want to say how honored and happy I am to be on your last show of this season. I hope you guys get to breathe out a little. Maybe how long you know what I'm talking about. You know, just <laughs> nobody works harder than you four ladies in this business. That's the, that is the God's honest truth. So enjoy the break. And thank you for having me on the last night. I'm super, super honored. Well, we are so happy to end this season with you. We're so happy you're here. And we also wanted to mention for any readers who are interested in picking up your book, you also have loads of bonus materials on your website, right? There's an interactive map. There's loads of videos you made in your research trip to Sicily. So there's all sorts of things that we can find to sort of supplement um, our reading. And I will say personally, having read it and loved it myself, you also are so good at just immersing us in that feeling of being there. I mean, you know, backstage beforehand, Christy mentioned even looking at your your book cover <laughs> evoked memories of the lemon cookies that you sent with the book <laughs> yeah. well for me the book is filled with that it's filled with the sights the smells the sounds the taste so um so we hope readers will check that out and we are thrilled that the world's finally getting to read the book and that you are here with us tonight to celebrate the release do you mind sticking around for one more second while we no, tell no, I, I never want to leave that? actually i'm never leaving <laughs> And you can chime in. So, okay, everyone, as we mentioned earlier, even though this is the last show of our winter season, which means we'll be dark for the next two weeks, but not dark, dark, because don't worry, we are cooking up a truly amazing schedule and it all will begin on April 19th, which is not that I'm counting, by the way, less than two weeks before the secret book of Flora Lee comes out. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> there she one. is. There she is. There she is. If you want to be the first to hear about our spring summer schedule, you can tune in next Wednesday, April 5th at 7 p.m. Eastern, right here on Facebook on Facebook and on YouTube. We got our own YouTube channel, y'all. Yeah, um, we're so fancy. Yeah. Actually, no Noah is so impressed by that because he watches Pokemon stuff on YouTube and he's like, Mom has a YouTube channel. So it's made me a hero. Thank you very That's much. That's awesome. You're yeah. in. Yeah. Along with Pokemon, uh, you will find <laughs> Friends of Fiction on YouTube and Facebook and you'll get a front row seat to the big schedule reveal hosted by Meg Walker, Ron Block, Lisa Harrison, and Bredna Gardner. 
Not only do we have some truly spectacular author guests on tap for you, but our spring-summer season will feature book launches for Patty in May, me in June, and Christy in July. If you've been with us for the last year, the last couple of years, um, you know that we always have fun surprises up our sleeves for those launch events, too. In other words, you won't want to miss a thing. In the meantime, you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. And don't miss Meg's announcement with Ron, Lisa, and Brenda next Wednesday, April 5th at 7 p.m. via Facebook Live on the Friends in Fiction Facebook page. After that, the four of us will be back on April 19th when we will return for our spring-summer season. We'll see you then. And thanks again to Lisa Scottolini. You are such a bright light. And Robert DeVerney for us tonight. We love you. We love you. Okay. Final words. Go out and buy her book. Damn it. She is checking. <laughs> she is checking those Amazon and BNN.com rankings. So, you know, give a girl something to live for. <laughs> Besides the pasta. She ate so much pasta for you. Buy her book. <laughs> buy her book. Damn it. Such a bird. It was such a burden, but I did it for my readers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. See you back here in April. Good night. Good night, Love everyone. Love you guys. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here.